Y Hot Springs, Arkansas, USA. Good evening, friends. It's really a grand privilege to be here tonight. And one thing to be back in Arkansas, and another thing to be on the campgrounds. I believe this is my first camp meetings that I have attended for a long time and had the invitation to come. And to begin with you, and I heard since you've just come in, you've been having a wonderful time here at this meeting. I'm so thankful for that. And I, coming up along the road just a few moments ago with my son, and we were talking about years ago when I first came down here to Arkansas, was the first time of my meetings. When I first started off, it was in Arkansas, in the evangelistic type of the meetings now anyhow. And since then, been seven times around the world, and now back in Arkansas, it's like bad money, always returns it. I have everywhere I've been, I suppose, in the United States, I've asked any people here from Arkansas. I've always had friends from Arkansas, pretty near everywhere. And I've always said some of the truest hearts I believe that ever beat was under them, old blue shirts down here in Arkansas, real fine people. I love you. And I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to be back tonight in Arkansas, be here with you. And so I think we've got three nights yet left in the convention and to have the opportunity to come in and express my love to Jesus Christ and have fellowship with you people and our fine bunch of brethren here, who many of them I don't know. I just looked around and seen one that I do know by the Jack Moore. And I happened to, uh, and Sister Moore, happened to recognize them then and certainly happy to be in. Now I know all day long you must get tired, you know, physically tired. We never get enough of get tired of praising and blessing God for his goodness, how wonderful he is. And but all day long and then when night time comes, then here I come in. And a kind of one of those ministers has been given the idea of speaking a long time. But I don't think we'll do it now because of this squeeze in the convention. We have had great speakers, no doubt, all through the day and through the convention, and then to stand up here on the platform. Why? Before all these fine speakers that I feel pretty small and stand here. One of the ministers I just shook hands with told me, this is your first services to have in this tabernacle. I would call it, I don't know just exactly what this temple or whatever it is. And we are certainly thankful again for the opportunity to come into a new church, something that's directed to the praise and glory of God. How wonderful. And we are just moved back or not moved back, just come back from the for the school vacation for the children. We live in Tucson, Arizona now, and it's been awfully hot out there, but we find that it's a little bit hotter here at home than it was out there because of the tremendous humidity, and it kind of puts us down after getting kind of used to the air there. We're going home, and the first service last Sunday, and we see the Lord Jesus continuing his great work of love and power among the people, and the same gospel that I preached to you 15 years ago here in Arkansas, I still believe the same thing, just don't change it, is Christ. Sunday, there was something taking place at the church. Just happened to look around and see the gentleman on which the miracles performed. Notice, we all love to brag on the Lord Jesus. We love to. I had a woman one time told me, she said, that's the only fault she could find with me. I bragged too much about Jesus. I said, I'll sure go to heaven if that's all the faults I had, bragging on Jesus. And so she, she just didn't think he was divine. She tried to say he was just a man and a philosopher or prophet or something on that order. But I said he was God. And so we, and she said, I can prove to you that he wasn't God. And I said, oh, I don't believe you can do that. She said, oh, I can prove he was only human. I said, now, I'll admit he was human, but he was both human and divine. She said he couldn't be divine. And I said, oh, he was divine. And he is divine. She said, oh, he couldn't be. I said, I'll prove it by your own Bible. I said, all right. And she said on St. John 11th chapter, on the road down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said Jesus wept. I said, well, what's I got to do with it? She said, well, if he, if he weeps, he proves he's not divine. I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken and stabbed to death dead. I said, you know better than that. I said, he was human as he went to the grave of Lazarus, crying, that's right. And when he straightened out his little shoulders up and said, Lazarus, come forth and a man has been dead for four days, stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man. 
I could do that. I still believe him to be that. Sunday was speaking. We, I was asking the people to turn around in a tabernacle and shake hands with each other. And there was a dear friend. I've just learned to love him. He we just come into the church, he and his wife. His wife is a registered nurse, and he himself is an Englishman. He's an Norwegian. How that ever happened, I don't know. But however, they're both fine people. And this brother had has had a little something wrong kind of in his heart. He's a very fine Christian man and an intellectual man too. He does secular work for accountants and so forth, but he turned around and when he did, a attack struck him and he pitched over on the floor dead. And his wife, being a nurse, grabbed him quickly and grabbed his pulse over his heart. He's gone. And I looked at his face real dark. His eyes were turned back, not just closed his eyes, but his eyes pushed out in front. And he was, I come over to the platform, tried to get the audience quietened. Many people were trying to help the sister, of course, in that condition with her husband. Someone laid something over his head, or under his head rather. I took a hold of his heart to his pulse at his arm, and no more pulse than there is on that piece of wood. And then I knelt down and I prayed, Lord Jesus, I pray thee to give back our we his life. And his heart beat four or five times and started off beating regularly again. And he came back up again and was trying to talk. He couldn't talk. He was, the blood stops, you know. When the heart stops and it was quite some time before he got his blood circulation went just right. And I had him call my name. And then I got back in the platform. By the way, I wonder if you just stand up so the people could see who the man was. That's a man that dropped it Sunday morning of heart attack, sister away, his wife and us, who's standing there to take his pubs to see and see that he. So I, that sounds very strange, maybe to people who wouldn't believe these things, but I have seen the Lord Jesus raise the dead many times, and that's not new to us. So we wouldn't, I think it's fine to brag on Jesus. But I think it ought to be some truth. What you are bragging about. So you have seen him, I've seen him in the last 15 years. Of many infallible cases raised up the dead. Especially one in Mexico where Brother Mo and I were standing in the Mexico City. A little baby died one morning at 9 o'clock with pneumonia in the doctor's office. And the little woman, we couldn't get her to the well. The man had given out all the prayer cards and we just had to number them as they would come up. There wasn't normal prayer cards, and the little Spanish sister, about, I guess, 25 years old, had a little dead baby, and it was raining, and she had it under a blanket. And the night before that, there had been a blind man that was probably as old as my father would be, probably 75, probably 70 years old blind, and received his sight when I was praying for him. And that night, platform, practically, as well as this is across here, was just strict ricks of or way high two or three feet with just shawls and hats and garments that have been laid up there and this little woman was trying to get up there and before my son came and said dad i got pretty near 300 ashes there and all 300 can't hold that little woman she had a dead baby under her little blue blanket i said well i said to brother jack Moore, go down brother jack Moore and i have a lot of things in common I don't want to say we look alike because he's such a handsome man. But one thing about the Mo with the Bopath are here the same way. We have a lot of things in common. I thought she never did know me, had to let me down on some ropes and things to get in. So I went down to pray for the little baby. I thought, well, they won't. She'll never know the difference. And so I was started to speak again. When Brother Espinoza know many of you brethren know him from the West Coast and doing the interpreting. This was out there by the bull ring in Mexico City and I looked out over the audience and I seen a vision of a little Mexican baby sitting smiling at me. So I said bring the little lady here. So I laid hands upon the little deaf stiff cold form. His feet begin to kick and begin to scream and there he was alive and I sent a runner Espinoza did to check with the doctor to get a statement before we could read it out and the doctor wrote an affidavit that, that baby died that morning in his office about nine o'clock and this was about 10 30 that night and the baby was living today enjoying good health to the honor and glory of god so seeing many things take place we wouldn't have to see about our brother way there but truth is truth and god doesn't do these things just to he wants it to be known 
and people to know that he loves them. And by the grace of God, by the way, sits among us tonight, living, we are thankful for that. I thought, being on the campground, coming in, just don't want to interrupt the great time. Billy was telling me this afternoon, said, you talk about real old-fashioned Pentecost, said, you wait till you get up there, said, they sing like they have had the experience for 50 years. I said, I guess some of them has here for 50 years. And I just love to get into a meeting like that. I believe every one of us do, where we just get right into it. Like I used to tell a little story about fishing. Up in northern New Hampshire, I was fishing for trout. And way up at the head of the mountain, I had a little tent sitting up there. And those little A tent little pup tent from the government and I had found a place where there was many trout was back under a bush bush and there was a moose willow there and every time I tried to wet my fly why it would catch in the willow. So that morning I got up, went up there early and I thought I'd cut the willows down. I'd just uh, if I killed a fish then I would eat it. Otherwise I would turn it loose. So I had all week all I could take care of and I was up there by myself and while I was gone that morning, on my road back, an old sow bear and two little cubs has got in tent, my tent. And you talk about wrecking things. They really had wrecked it right. And they had tore everything up. And I thought, when I come back, I had a noise. And I looked around some little bushes I was coming around. And the old mother bear and all of them was just having them a time, wrecking through everything. And she saw me and she ran off and called two little cubs. One of the cubs come and the other one didn't come. Little bitty fellow, spring, he was just as so high and he was sitting like this. And I thought, well, what's the little fellow so interested in? And I got around and looked. I said to her, get out of there, get out of there. And he just sit there, I thought. And I watched the old mother because, you know, to fool with her cubs, she would scratch you, you know. So I watched. There's a tree pretty close, you know, and had an old rusty pistol laying over there in the tent. Was probably broke up then. And anyhow, I wouldn't want to shoot the old mother and leave two orphans in the woods. So I kept watching this tree, getting around to see what the little fellow was so fascinated. And you know, I like pancakes. We, we're all southerners, aren't we? Flapjacks is what they are down here, you know. So, and I really love them. And I know there's not much when it is about me. I really like to pour on the molasses. I really baptize them right, pour it all over them. So I don't like just a little bit of sprinkle like you get in these places here, a little thing. I like to get where you really pour it on, you know, and get them mixed good and heavy. I had me a half a gallon bucket full of good old sorghum. This little bear had got the top off and he was really enjoying the molasses kept watching him around the corner. He take his little paw and stick down in his bucket, you know, and he didn't know how to get the molasses out. So he just stick in his paw down in my molasses and then rake it up and lick when he come down. I tell you, when I finally got around and got his attention, he looked at me, he couldn't see me. He was molasses from the top of his head all the way down. His little belly was just as full of molasses and his eyes, he couldn't open his eyes to look at me you know trying i thought that's right there's no condemnation to them that's eating puts in the mind of a good old pentecostal meeting when we get our arms down in that honey jar about that deep you know of that pentecostal honey you know the strange thing about it after i got his tummy full and my bucket sopped out he went over to his mommy and a little brother and the mommy licked him so you know I hope we get so much on us here that when we go home, those who didn't come will lick off of us. A little of experience. Tell them about how great things the Lord has did down here in Hot Springs, the Lord bless you. And now I believe they told me that they didn't get it in time or something another to announce to give out prayer cards to pray for the sick. Some numbers on cards, we call them and pray for them. And now like that, so it's give me one night to kind of get acquainted. And so tomorrow night, I think they're going to give out their prayer cards sometime in the afternoon. Is that, yeah, they're already six o'clock, six o'clock tomorrow evening. Now I thought tonight, we just a little portion of the scripture here and read it and see if we will 
could find what the Lord would have to tell us. And now just before we open the book, let's speak to the author of the book as we bow our heads. Before we pray and your heads bowed and all the cares now, the frolic of the day and the little senses of humors we've had, let's just push it aside now because we're approaching the king. Is there any special request I'd like to be remembered? Just would you raise your hand and say, Lord, write down in my heart, just hold your request. Hi, Heavenly Father, we deem this such a great privilege a great privilege of God Almighty to come into the congregation of the Lord to worship together, testifying, telling of the great things that you have done and the places that we have been. And it just reminds me of Acts 4 in the Bible when they returned and were speaking of what the Lord had done, and they all prayed. And the place was shook where they were assembled together. God, we are not so anxious tonight to see the building shook. But we would like for you to shake us, Lord, shake our understanding, shake our being, our emotion, our hearts of understanding that we might live here tonight more determined than ever to serve you, that we might feel the presence of a new, fresh Pentecost, of a Holy Spirit pouring out upon us afresh and anew, like down in these woods and hills in Arkansas, 50 years ago, when the forefathers come through here in horses and wagons preaching this gospel, dear Lord, may we, the bearers of this great worthy cause that you have sent through here, May we not be ashamed of this great thing, but may we walk in the footsteps of those who went before us, Lord, packing the banner of the Lord Jesus. May others who have not yet accepted this great plan of salvation that God laid down for us in the scripture, foretold all the way down to the Old Testament, and today we are enjoying it. May there be a great shaking among us, Lord, and a renewing of faith and a renewing of efforts. I thank you for this convention, for this bunch of people who are still holding on, Lord, in this hour of trial has come upon the earth to try those who are professing to be Christians. May we be found at the end worthy to enter into the joys of the Lord that has been prepared for the redeemed since the foundation of the world. Bless the world. Lord, remember every hand that went up. You know the objective, you know the motive, you know the request behind that hand. I pray God that you will grant to each it to each one, may every man, that woman, boy, or girl that put their hand up their hand that wanted more salvation or closer walk or to know you as your savior, may they never leave this ground till that request is answered. To those who are sick and needy, we pray God there will be such a wave of healing across this place that there will not be a feeble person that comes on this ground will live in the way that they come on. You who can raise a man up from the dead and present him here before us, it shows that in the same God that stood there by the grave of Lazarus called him out from among the dead. Father, let them know that you are the same as the dead forever. Here stands one among us tonight, just a few days ago, called back from the land beyond the shadow of a man's knowing in this life. How we thank thee for this. Bless us together now as we study your word, for truly thy word is truth. Thy and thy word are one. They cannot be separated. So we ask your blessings upon us, Father, as we wait upon you to speak to us tonight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you will, I'd like to turn to scriptures and so forth. I kind of laid down on the bed and went to sleep. The first thing you know, Billy, come up and said, let's go. Said, you mean it's church time? I had to pull out a little bunch of scriptures I had used before to speak on tonight. And I thought maybe it will be give out some cards and be praying for the sick and so forth. I've noticed since I've come in here, two people are laying on courts, perhaps come to be prayed for tonight. Now, and Billy come back, said, I just didn't get in in time, Daddy. Talked about it, said, we'll try tomorrow night. I said, all right, you get the brethren, give it, give some cards out. So now I want you to turn with me to the second book of book of Second Kings in the first chapter, and then also I want to turn in there to Jeremiah, the eighth chapter and twenty second of us. Let's read just a portion of the scripture. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Isaiah fell down to the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick, and he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel, that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou hast gone up, but thou shalt surely die, and like the departed. And then in the book of Jeremiah, the 8th chapter, and the 22nd verse, Is there no bug in Gilead? Is there is there no physician there? 
Why then is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? I want to speak if we would call it on the subject, why? It's a question, and God is asking this question. And God is eternal. We know he is. He is everlasting. He never had a beginning, or he can never have an end. Eternity never started. It never ends, because it's eternal. And God cannot change his mind nor his way. And that's why that we as people who will not accept creeds if it's contrary to the word, because we believe that God and his word is the same. We believe that the Bible says in St. John, the first chapter, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made fresh and dwelt among us. Therefore, when God says anything, He cannot tomorrow or any other time ever take it back. When God is ever called on the scene to make a decision, and His one decision is eternal, it can never be changed. And God was called to make a decision for the human race. In the Garden of Eden, when the first sin was committed, could He ever be able to redeem His lost child back into fellowship with Him again? And He fixed one program, and it's never changed by the way of the blood. And for all the scriptures, it never did alter or change, and it never can because it's God's decision by the blood. Although we try to alter it, you have tried to educate it, you have tried to denominate it, you have tried to do everything there is in man's law to try to change that, like Adam did by the fig leaves and so forth, but it still ever remains. The blood is the only place of worship. Therefore, together tonight, we can stand not as one denomination, maybe many of us together, but we can't stand here to represent one denomination. We have to stand here in this fellowship under the blood of Jesus Christ, we can all be brethren, sisters, God makes a way for man, and then man refuses to walk in that way. Then God has got a right to ask, why didn't you do it? And that's what he did then, and that's what he does now, and that's why he will, what he will ask at the judgment, they've asked why. Now a scripture reading started off, just immediately after the death of Ahab, a bad king, a borderline believer, a man who knowed what was right to do, and yet did not have the courage to step out and do what he knew it was right to do. I just think if this if this world isn't contaminated today with Ahab's, this Christendom that we live in, is contaminated with Ahab's, with man who really know that it's right to give your life and be to God and be filled with the Spirit and follow the teachings of this Bible, and yet without the courage to stand and do it, reminds me again of another situation like that in Sodom. The Bible said the sins of Sodom vexed the righteous soul of Lot daily, and how that the art man's soul was righteous, and he looked out upon the sins of the land, and he knew that what was wrong, that they were doing wrong, and yet without the courage to stand for his conviction. No wonder the whole world has become a Sodom and Gomorrah, and how that the laws today across the nation and around the world standing in churches who is convinced that Jesus Christ is the same message then forever and that his power is just as real today as it ever was without the courage to stand in the pulpit and denounce sin because of some barrier that would excommunicate them from a fellowship that they had joined into still come back to the blood of Jesus Christ the only remedy why why Isaiah was the son of Ahab had been brought up in a kind of a home that was a lukewarm home. He wasn't altogether Christian. His mother was a heathen, and his father had married out of fellowship, married a woman that was not a believer. And that always makes a bad home for any kid to be raised in, that when unbelief and faith tries to mix it together. And now if the father would have been a real strong man in his faith, the child might have had a better opportunity. But he didn't. He didn't have. He knew that there was God. He knew that there was a Jehovah, and then he, his mother's gods, and so forth, he was all confused. Then after the death of his father, this boy in this condition kind of mixed up one way and another, and in that in a picture that runs today, one in the family is this way, and one another, and one going this way, and one going that way. No wonder we're producing such much juvenile delinquency, and all other kinds of stuff under the name of Christianity is because there is no unity, there is no real call out and stand for God. Now we find that this fellow falling heir to his father's throne one day, he, up at the top of his balcony somewhere walking around, he fell through the lattice, might have been over intoxicated and fell through the lattice, down probably on the bottom floor, struck a bench or something and broke a few ribs or bruised him up. And the sickness must have started on the infection somewhere or the bruise and caused him to have fever. And was pretty sick. Of course, them days they didn't have the remedies that they have now. 
perhaps the doctors came and done what they could for the fellow, but they didn't have the sufficiency. Then he knew his only thing that he could do would be to go on a higher power than what the doctors could produce in the terminology of medicine. And he thought he would go then and he sent to his mother what a lesson that ought to be to mothers. A kid who usually listen to his mama. And he sent to his sent to his mother's god Belzebub over to Akron, where his statue was, his monument, and said, Go consult the priest over there, and let them consult the statue of Belzebub whether I will recover of this sickness that I have or not. But you know, that man really, could you imagine a people who are supposed to be a God-fearing people would let such a man rule over them? It's because of a local condition. It was a condition that the church had got into that put such a person in power or well, permitted it. I don't think times have changed very much. They still seem to be a whole lot of the same thing to a lot the same way. And let this man rule, have the say so over the country that would control some statue of a some pagan idea about his condition and then you know behind it all no matter how much it seems that god has turned his face from the people he does at some time to see what kind of an attitude you take every son that comes to god has to be tried and chastened and then there's a little spot in a man or woman when they're born of the spirit of god that's eternal and you'll get into a place sometime where to where everything that's human about you in reasoning, the devil can reason it away from you. But when it all breaks away, then if that eternal life isn't there, you will fall also because you can reason yourself away from God. But a man that claims to be a Christian has no right in the pulpit or has no right in the office, a leader anywhere, until first he has climbed them steps into a place to where he is born of the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Spirit Ghost, in such a way that nobody can explain it away from him. God, when he sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver the people, first he took him on the backside of the desert and then took all the theology he had in him out in 40 years and then appeared to him. He knew more about God in five minutes in the presence of that burning bush than he knew in the 40 years of learning he had, that he got. That's what the church needs tonight is another burning bush experience where slick tongue people where the scripture says that the two spirits in the last days will be so close it will deceive the very elected if possible. A man ought to first get on that sacred ground with God where all the theologians, all the doctors of divinity, all the reasonings, all the atheists, nothing else can ever explain that away from him. He was there when God came and he knows what took place. You can't reason it out of him. He was there when it happened. And that's the kind of man we need today in the government, in the church, and anywhere else in the times like this. For leadership, we need a man that's filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what the church needs today, not a theologian, but a spirit-filled, born-again man, full of the Holy Ghost, I tell you. If we had more of that, the church would look a little different than it does in the present time. Things would be different if we just had more man filled with the God Spirit, not going after traditions of the elders and so forth. Now we find that this fellow sent up there to get this information from the gate of Ekron and Belzebub. But all the time God knew he was doing it. So he had a prophet down there by the name of Elijah. So he spoke to Elijah and said to go up there to a certain road and stand in that way messengers are coming up you see you cannot hide nothing from god see no matter what you're doing now how little did that fellow know that god was speaking to elijah way down there in the wilderness somewhere in a little mud hut somewhere and could tell him to go stand in the corner of the road up there and speak to these fellows and tell them to get back down to him and tell him thus saith the lord he's not coming off of that bed and he said, ask him, why did you do it? What makes you do it? Is it because there, there is no God in Israel? Is it because he doesn't have a prophet? Is that the reason he did it? Why? You know what happened. You know the scripture. You've got them in your own palace. The priests around there, no doubt, you've read the sins are boring. And why did you do such a do such a silly thing as that. I wonder tonight if Christ would come on the scene over the nation today in drawing this nation to judgment, if that same question would have been asked. Why is it? Is it? Why is it we are doing these things? Why are we fasting in the government? Whether we should read the Bible in public, 
and why if we are reading all this nonsense do you know our forefather said is going to show in order do you know this nation be born upon the principles of bible aren't we here for freedom of religion to act in god the way we feel fit to act the way that we are convinced is truth but you see we have done something like they did then we are just letting everything politics follow us up instead of respecting our faith in our god and man who have stood for truth and we are letting our politics run over that and voting in such stuff as that's polluting this nation and while we're coming to a judgment god will rise on the scene someday with a mighty prophet speak in this generation and tell the people and they'll see that it's god speaking but they won't repent it'll be like just like it was then he said if there is no god in israel is it because there's no god same as jeremiah said is there no bomb in gilead is there no fish in there then they could not answer that cause there was well he said then why why did you do it why is the daughter of people not healed now we wonder that tonight why is there no bible is there no god is there no difference if god is going to bring the people to judgment he has got to have something to judge them by there has got to be some standard if he's going to judge them by the catholic church then if they judge by the roman church the greek church is lost and the other catholic churches are lost if you judge it by the greek the roman is lost if you judge it by the lutheran the methodists are lost if you judge it by the methodists the lutheran is lost he can't judge it by a church there is too many different organizations of it but god will judge the world he said by jesus christ and jesus christ is a word and the word is god and he will judge them by this bible for this is the word this is god's standard we must measure up to what the bible says and we wonder why we got so much confusion so much organization so such differences separating brotherhood and everything is because there is no bombing gilead is it because there's no physician there i wonder if god would ask us that question now it wasn't it wasn't exactly they didn't have a physician and they did god was a physician and it wasn't because there wasn't a god in israel and there was a god and they had a prophet to consult to find out what these things are but it was a king's own stubborn will and that's exactly and that's what's the matter in the nation today is the people own stubborn will not because we don't have the same god as crossed the red sea with these people that fed them 40 years in the wilderness it's not because that we don't have the same god that we had in the beginning it's the people's own stubborn way they don't want to bow down they don't want to have anything to do with the holiness and purity of living the bible way of living they would rather belong to church and put their name on a book and live like the rest of the world than to bow down to the promises and the commandments of almighty god that's what's the matter today that's the reason things are going the way they are people get away from the word we will never be able to straighten get straightened out till we get back onto the right path they built this building put that corner down here somewhere you would never get the building built you've got to be laid on the foundation and the foundation is the bible the doctrines of the apostles and prophets and so forth of the bible the king's own step away he didn't he just didn't want to send it down there it wasn't very popular god's real true way of living has never been popular it never will be popular for the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish paul said i'm not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ for it's the power of god and salvation to them that I believe now we find out here that the king was stubborn just something like today a patient will lay right on a what if a patient went to a doctor and laid down on his steps and he had some kind of a fever that was going to kill him and the doctor come to the door and said sir i've got the medicine in here he's saying ah i just ain't come on in i'll give you the injection the inoculation i don't want your medicine and see now sir i can help you if you'll just come on in well i'm not coming in and the man laid there on the doctor's step and died die on the doctor's steps because he won't accept the inoculation for typhoid fever or ever what it is that he had he won't accept the inoculation for it and the man dies right on the doctor's doorstep now the man you can't blame the doctor if he has the medicine that will that will cure the disease and the doctor is willing to give it and it's been provided and the man said come as close as the doctor's doorstep and sit down there and die you can't blame the doctor you can't blame the medicine it's the man that be to blame dying on the doctor's doorstep with a disease that there is a medicine to be cured can cure it on the inside well that's just a parable but you know god has a medicine inside of his kingdom that will cure every 
sin disease there is in the world and the people sit right on the church doorstep not only that but they sit right in the pew and die and are lost and go to hell because they refuse to accept the doctor's medicine amen that's right they absolutely refuse to take the doctor's medicine therefore they die with the fevers and the people sit in the church and hear the messages of god and believe them and won't accept it they wouldn't say well now i don't believe that's right some of them will come say and i agree with it say i believe it's right but you won't do it see you'll die dying in the pews of the church because they won't accept the remedy they won't see what it does it takes a little bit of the popularity out of the people it's kind of beats them up a little bit they're afraid of that new bath you know any bath is a mess i don't care what it is if it's in a pig pen or a pink decorated hospital it's a mess and so is a new bath. It'll make you do things that you didn't think you would do. It'll straighten you up. But before you can ever get right, you have to come through the, that mess. That's right, amen. Before a seed can ever be born, it has to die and rot. And that's what's the matter with the people today. They don't want to die and rot out to the world so they can be born again of the Holy Ghost. See, that's right. They're afraid of that new bath. They're afraid. It makes them do things that they don't want to do. It takes a popularity out of them. It takes a starch out of them. Oh, I tell you, I'm glad that there is an inoculation tonight that will take it out of you, brother. That will take the world out. It will make people, brotherhood, associate together regardless of denominational differences. It will make a pair of overalls, put our arms around a tuxedo suit and holler, brother, I'm glad to see you. Amen. Sure, but you, they're afraid of that inoculation. Oh, my. It's a dangerous to refuse a doctor's medicine, you know. If you're going to him and it's afraid of, if you refuse a medicine, it's danger, you may die. But that, that you'll just die physically from not taking the doctor's medicine. But how much more dangerous is it to refuse God's inoculation from sin? Here some time ago, I had a little sick spell, and someone said to me, said, well, Billy, and said, did you keep your religion during your sickness? Said, you know, you believe in divine healing. Did you keep your religion? I said, no, it kept me. Not the idea of me keeping it, it keeps me. When the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary, God made a preparation. When man first sinned, he left himself a great chasm that he crossed, leaving himself no way back. God, rich in mercy, accepted a substitute, and that was the blood of a lamb or a bullock. And that substitute lasted for years. Moses stood under the inspiration of God when sin was not even divorced. It was just simply covered by the blood of bulls and goats, and he had the glory of God upon him until he could speak flies into existence. He could speak frogs into existence because a word is a thought expressed and god brought his thoughts to moses and moses spoke them in words and when the word spoke and the whole world was framed by the word of god there used to be a time when i'd get in school get some black ink on my shirt mama used to take my shirt off and say hand it to me quick honey and she would put some coal oil on it and all it done was just scattered it made a great big ring spot where she put the coal oil on the ink that's all she knew about that was the best she had but it's different today they have manufactured a stuff called bleach and you it's a chemical that whenever that ink drops back into that chlorox or bleach whatever it is when it strikes that you cannot find that black no more at all what happens to it drop a drop of black ink in a tub of bleach why you don't have nothing you can't find any fumes if i was a chemist this this was may not be just exactly true to science but i'd say how is it it's an h2o water for one thing then there's a chemical in it and made it black there is only one original color and that's right all other colors are perversions from that and now i see and then if you would break it up from there and maybe you would say well it turned into an acid when it hit the bleach it turned to an acid all right then where did the acid go the acid went back now it's coloring we're talking about in this the coloring see it went back to molecules see molecule four times six plus nine makes molecule h if it would come out of four plus six plus eight what will it come out? Pink instead of black. Then it went back from there to atoms. Then from atoms plus 1 plus B2 plus 3 makes 4, which puts it with molecule H means what? Then you come back to black again. And then when you go beyond that, you might go on to electrons. Where did you go 
to from there you will have to go back because it is a creation it had to come from a creator you have to make it therefore it went all the way back to the creator and the coloring that was in that ink it can never return again now god seeing that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin he never manufactured but he created a chemical in the blood of jesus christ amen that sin was one confessed in the right way you don't even bridge that chasm you make the chasm completely away and god don't even know that you ever sinned that's right he said he put them in the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more at all against you then men and women stands in the presence of god as sons and daughters of god the very nature of their god in their hearts where there is the church today brother what's happened to the church when we can see that the blood of Jesus Christ so remitted sins that God don't even remember we sinned. Then, whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. What's the matter? It's because somebody has been indocumenting the scriptures for the people. This is the only thing that I can figure has been done because God's remedy is still the same. Now, now it's dangerous to refuse a doctor's inoculation. How much more God now? How does man ever find a medicine anyhow to work on a human being? You know what chemist does? Or chemists, they take a disease and find out what kind of a germ is in it. Then they get some kind of a poison antidote and so forth, enough poison enough to kill you and enough antidote to keep it from doing it and then inject it, it first into a guinea pig. Then they give the guinea pig the disease that you've got and then they put the medicine in the guinea pig and if the guinea pig survives it, then they give it to you. So that's quite a thing, you know, give it to a guinea pig and see if he can take it. And if the guinea pig don't die then they give it to you not all people are made like guinea pigs you know so it kills some and helps the other but there is one thing about the second inoculation that jesus christ gives it helps everybody it's not a remedy it's a cure you've had people say today number one killer is heart disease i differ with them not to be different i just differ because i know it's wrong the number one killer is sin disease right not all heart disease it's sin disease you know some people say well now brother branham i believe you sketched uh stretched the blanket there a little bit now let me ask you something a man has to sin i just have to sin a little bit every day that's because you have never been inoculated that's all saying uh-huh yeah you never tried god's remedy that's right if you would do that then you wouldn't do it see i just have to smoke Something just makes me smoke. Try the inoculation one time and find out whether it works or not. You say, I just can't keep from doing this. I, well, you just, you just take God's toxin one time and see how it does to you. A woman said to me not long ago, I was getting onto her about wearing these little old scandal clothes. And she said, no, Brother Branham, let me tell you, you have no right to say that. We got to wear our shorts if you want to. I said, I guess that's right. But if you was a Christian, you wouldn't want to wear them. She said, and she said, well, now wait for the Branham. She said, you know, they don't make any other kinds of clothes, but just those sexy clothes and so forth like that. I said, they still got bold goods and make sewing machines. There is no right no excuse that's right it's because they don't want to take the inoculation of the feeling of the holy spirit old-fashioned god saved camp meeting holiness amen that's right it used to be wrong to do these things it's still wrong but but that's right but what's the matter like something happened it used to be that people that would act like that they were even excommunicated from society now they can't be brought into society until they do do it and so you see it depends on where your heart is there your treasures are also or where your treasure your heart is also you must remember that if the you love the lord with all your heart then you live clean and pure the wife and i went over to the supermarket here some time ago we seen a strange thing a woman with a dress on it was a strange thing in our country and Mida said to me she said bill i know that them some of them women sing in choirs down here in the churches and she said i know them and she said now why what makes them I said, well, you see, honey, I said, being a missionary as myself, I said, we are a different country, of a different country. She said, what? I said, we are of a different country, a different nation. She said, aren't we Americans? I said, we live here, but this is not our home. 
We are pilgrims. We are seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. I went into Finland. I seen the way they acted in Finland. I went in and down into Germany. I seen the way they had the German spirit. I went down into Switzerland. They had the Switzerland spirit. I come to America. They've got a American spirit. She said, well then, what about us? I said, we was born from above, heavenly, where purity and holiness and righteousness and honesty. Yes, I said, therefore, those who profess that look not upon the things of the world, but we plainly see by our lives the end, the way we live, that we have a God, we have a kingdom, we have a place that we are going. And this is not our home, amen, my like that. I begin to feel pretty religious right now. Yes, sir, I believe in this old-time Holy Ghost salvation. Oh, brother, sister, it does something to you. The same God lived one time, still lives today. His same, his same doctrine of holiness. Just lives tonight, the same as it ever lived. Just the same thing. Yes, sir, notice the people has got away from the doctrine of it, that's all. Yes, now, yes, sir. Our number one heart disease doesn't. The main thing that kills the people today, it's number one sin disease. And sin is unbelief. Unbelief in what? The Bible, that's right. Yes, it's the number one sin disease that kills the people today, both spiritually and that will make them kill them physically, of course, because they already can prove that man that holds grudges and women who fast and stew and fight and argue, they die. It will cause cancer, fungus, everything else will set in answers. See, you are made to be happy and free. You are made to live like children before your father. And you know that he makes every day everything work right for you each day. Yes, sir. The people is just afraid of this new birth. That's all. They are afraid to come to it because it will straighten them up. It will make you quit playing bingo, quit playing these slot machines. It will make you quit staying home on Wednesday night from prayer meeting to watch We Love Susie and all those other crazy things that Hollywood has got. And then dirty jokes that's cracked over there. It will make, it will make you let your hair grow out long. It will make a man quit smoking cigarettes. Then, being in church as deacons, it will make the people quit lying, stealing. It will do something for you. It will clean you up. It will give you salvation that there is and nothing in the world can explain it away from you because you know you were there when it happened. Yes, sir. Now, as I said a little while ago, when God, when man finds medicine, the thing that they do, they search for the ceremony. Then they find this disease. Then they inject it into a guinea pig and see if the guinea pig survives it. Now, when God was going to bring down this inoculation that I'm speaking of tonight, this balm of Gilead, he didn't find a guinea pig, he came himself. Amen. Only way he could do is come in the form of his son and was made flesh and dwelt among us in order to take the sting of death. He came to die. The only way he could die, he couldn't die uh, as a spirit, as a man. So he was formed a body called Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God dwelt in his body, making himself Emmanuel on earth to take away the sin of man. That was that chemistry that was in that blood. Somebody said he was a Jew. He wasn't not a Jew. Some of them said he was a Gentile. He was not a Gentile. He was nothing less than God. The Bible said that we are saved by the blood of God. The blood comes from the middle sex. We know that. The hemoglobin is out of the middle. The female is only the egg. That's right. Like I said there, like springtime, these old mother birds are building nests out here and laying eggs. Some of them will lay a nest full of eggs that will never hatch too. Why? She could lay a nest full of eggs and she could sit on them and just be so loyal. She could turn them eggs each day and stay there away from food until she gets so poor and couldn't hardly fly off the nest no matter how much she babies them how much she pets them and how loyal she is to them they'll never hatch why she hasn't been in with the meat and they are not fertile therefore they'll just lay there and rot and that's what's the matter with a lot of our conferences that's what's the matter with our camp meeting many of them today and our conferences what do we get a bunch of pets and sissified preachers that ought why it's a disgrace and come in there because he has got a little prestige or a little education push him up above everything above something i'd uh, my only thing we need today is we got a nest full of rotten eggs what we need today what we need is a good 
old fashioned nest cleaning time all the way from there that we will push it out until we get men and women that's filled with the Holy Ghost and that's been with the meat Jesus Christ and is filled with the spirit that he was baptized with that's right then we got the life in the camp yes uh, toxin they're afraid of it Jesus Christ the son of God when he was born some of them said well now he was he was the egg of Mary he wasn't if Mary had to get that egg down through the tube and to the womb there had to be a sensation so you see what you put God doing he was neither no part of it. God the Creator overshadowed the Virgin Mary and created the cells within her womb and brought forth a man which was Emmanuel. God himself made flesh among us with no help from anybody. He is the Creator who made the first man. Amen. Oh my, there he is, there he stands, yes sir. And then he did that so he could take the miraculation. Any real good scientist, good doctor, that finds a disease, some of them will go over to a prison camp and get some man to try it out that's going to have life in prison if he survives the inoculation. Why? Then the poison don't kill him. He can go free if he's ready to take the inoculation. Prisoners wait for that. Oh, that's a doctor. That's afraid of his medicine. But you know, God wasn't afraid of his own medicine. In a manger, a man standing on the banks of the Jordan, when the inoculation fell down there, he seen it like a dove coming down from heaven, and he was inoculated. And a voice said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. Amen. God in man. And that's the inoculation. God in man. The world watched him. Every temptation, he stood it. When they spit in his face, pulled the beard out and spit on him, it stood the temptation. In the hours of trial, it stood the temptation. It held the inoculation that he received at Jordan. It held. It held in the time of popularity. What's the matter with a lot of our churches today? God will bless them. They get started. And that's what's hurting a Pentecostal people. They ought to be back like our grandfathers was with a tin pan or a tambourine down on the corner somewhere beating a tambourine. Then it would be laying these big morgues that we are building today, trying to fashion after other people. What we need is a good old-fashioned outpouring of the Holy Ghost that would clean you up, in, including your pastors of your Pentecostal church. That's right. Now, the thing of it was that when the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at the day of his baptism, he was inoculated. We have watched him in the hour of trial. When the devil tried to give him all the kingdom of the world, what did he do? He said, right with the word, amen. What I'm wondering today, that many brethren out in the field since this last day revival, why is it when you get a few nickels or a change of clothes, you're too big to go somewhere? Two, oh, something another, and you have to have something bigger than the other one. It's become a regular actress. It's a shame. God wants man that will humble himself and get down there into a place. Somebody he can speak to, but it's become such a rat race. Everybody is trying to get something bigger than the other fellow. It's A and C. They can't stand the prestige of the temptation of Satan. But our Lord stood the temptation. The inoculation held. When the time came, there was a debate on the scripture. He said exactly the word. Satan said, it is written. He said, it's also written. Oh, it's glory. God in man, see? Why did he have, he had something with him to back up every word he said? He said, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if you can't believe me, believe the works that he does through me. Oh my, and there you are. What we need is men and women like that today that can shut the mouth of the world by the signs of the Holy Ghost. We need a camp meeting like that. We need a turning upside down, a shaking out a lot of the world and things out of the church that's come in these last days, money is scattering out through the country and big things has got the people minds on big things instead of on God, compromising, compromising with the scripture. Any brother who started out on that way, but they get popular in some organization, compromise on what he believed. That blood doesn't run in a genuine Holy Ghost born man. All devils in hell can't upset him on that word, he'll stand on that regardless of what, amen. Paul said there is nothing present or future can come or anything can separate us from the love of God. That real genuine birth of the Holy Spirit comes into a man. He's a son of God. There is no chasm between him and God. And he is his son in his presence, amen. I like that. I know that's true, all right? 
we find out that in the hour of temptation for worldly things the nucleation held in a time of being called holy roller or made fun of put a rug around his face his eyes and hit him on the head with a stick said now if you are a prophet tell us who hit you and then roman soldiers they seen him discerning the thoughts of the people to stand out and if he was standing here tonight he would look around and tell that woman what was wrong with her and what was this and that that's the way he did it that's the way he still does it cause he doesn't change amen and you glad that's a living god that a man could fall out of a roof and the life go out of him and a man standing there with god in him could lay himself over that man and he lived again that same god lives tonight amen he is the unchangeable god the church needs an inoculation that's right as david places one said god don't have no grandchildren that's right where a pentecostal brethren are becoming the children come into church and say well we're pentecostal because papa was if papa was a pentecostal and got the baptism of the holy ghost you'll have to get it the same way papa did he don't have grandchildren he just has sons and daughters not grandsons and granddaughters just sons and daughters is true so you've got to do the same thing they did on the day of pentecost you've got to have the same experience you've got to have the same thing that they had god don't never change his program he never changes his ways he just does the same thing all the time the way he lays down his program it must do to that each time it's got to be the same thing and if you will do the same thing the same results will come amen that's right now we find out it held in terms of temptation it held when everything was going wrong it held when all of his friends forsook him he still held and then accretion held then the devil thought i got him now he started up calvary the blood was streaming out of his body his garment wrapped around him one big splash of blood the devil must have said i got him now that can't be god no no that can't be him if he would let them sort of spit in his face if he would let them jack handfuls of beer out of his face if he would let them challenge him to see a vision and he didn't do it and now here he goes up the hill packing that cross i'll have him in a few minutes that bee of death come down and circling around to sting him you know like any bee he has a stinger in it but you know god has prepared a flesh for that time it was a flesh of god when that stinger once anchored in that son of god into emmanuel when he pulled himself out he had no stinger left he took the sting right out of death no wonder paul could say death where is thy sting grave where the victory but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ he could sting elijah and die he could sting elijah and remain his stinger but you know if a bee ever stings deep enough he can't pull sting no more he pulls his stinger out so there was no human flesh that he could anchor in oh my no one that he could anchor in but when he put it in emmanuel that time he lost his stinger thanks be to god yes sir he failed on that one yes sir they found out the toxin held they said if you be the son of god come down of the cross the high priest the big dignitary of the church said tell us plainly now if you're the son of god come down off of the cross and save yourself and so forth let us see if you're the son of god he never opened his mouth and said a word now we find out that he died he really died he died until the sun and the moon said he died all of nature said he died the earth quaked it had as nervous children over it and when they seen the very god that created the earth was hanging on top of the earth and Emmanuel's blood dropping upon the ground no wonder he died he dealt with everything said he was dead and then you're going to find out before he died he said you destroy this temple and i'll raise it up again on the third day you'll never be able to keep it down destroy it and it'll bring it up on the third day they put a guard around to find out the inoculation was going to hold the sin it held through temptation of sin it held through poverty it held through riches it held through all kinds of temptation it still held but now it's in death what it's going to do now but on easter morning oh my just before that sun rose up that inoculation took a hold and when it did death broke its barriers the grave opened up and he rose again on the third day and ascended on high it shows that that inoculation is the inoculation of eternal life you can't destroy it even the belly of hell can't hold it the grave can't hold it death can't hold it nothing can hold it it'll rise again jesus 
Christ said, all the Father's given me will come to me, and I'll raise it up again on the last day. Hallelujah. A man or a woman that's been inoculated with this cannot stay in the grave. No grave can hold the righteous. No hell can keep it. No grave, no nothing else. Jesus Christ promised to raise it up again on that day. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad of that. That inoculation, you know, on Easter morning it proved. Did you know what it was? It was such a great thing till 120 people wanted to get inoculated. Now, if he can keep through temptation, there was 120 people who knew him real well. They wanted the inoculation. So right then, he had to go up to the laboratory and fix the serum. So he said, you go up there to the city of Jerusalem till I get it. All the formula mixed up. I'm going to send it down to you. So they went up there to wait. How the Christian church should be run. What kind of an inoculation would it take? What what would be the inoculation? How would they do? What will take place? Should they all go away to the seminary and learn to have a PhD and LLD? Should some priest come up the road with a kosher in his hands and leak out and take the communion and that's it? But there came a sound from heaven. The inoculation was on its road like a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting cloven tongues set upon them like fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Did you ever see in the old temple the picture of it? There was a little side door that went out, went up along the stair steps, went up in the upper room. They closed the doors and went in because they were afraid. But I'm telling you, when they got inoculated like a fresh branded calf, they couldn't hold him, no sound. Out of that room he came out into the streets. He went, he was in a created death, hell, persecution, laughed at, made fun of, made no difference to him. He was in a created, oh my. Amen. Oh my. Listen at Peter standing up there. They begin to ask, is there any more balm in Gilead? Is there any more balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Oh yeah. We got plenty of balm in Gilead. We got plenty of physicians. In that day, Dr. Simon Peter, he was a physician. He said, I'm going to write your prescription. I'm going to tell you, and this is an eternal prescription because it's going to be for you and for your children and for them that's far off. Frankly, it's for everyone who will call upon the Lord thy God shall call upon. I'm going to give it to him. He said, what can we do to get inoculated? There is where she lives. What can we do to be inoculated? He said, I'll write a prescription. He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this prescription is for you and your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord of God shall call. Oh my, you know what? When a doctor finds a remedy for disease and he writes out a prescription and some quack druggist gets a hold of it and goes to adding a little of this and taking a little of this out of it, he'll either kill the patient or do something to it. The prescription doesn't even have in any enough medicine in it to do any good. If it don't, it's so weak you won't help the patient. And that's what's the matter with a lot of these seminary druggists today. They take their prescription out and add something else instead of it. And you got a bunch of dying moles. This prescription still remains the same. When the Samaritans received it, they got inoculated. They had the same thing. When the Gentiles received it, they got the same prescription. Paul met a bunch on, in Acts 19 who had part of the prescription. Not all of it. He said, that won't work. You're going to kill the whole thing. So he wrote it over for them, told them how to get it. They got it the same way. And that's what's the matter today. There is plenty of bombing Gilead. And we got plenty of physicians, but the people are afraid of the prescription. Glory. Praise be to God. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no power of the Holy Spirit? Now, is there? And this inoculation works on all, see? It did on the Jews. It did on Samaritans. It did on the Gentiles. It does on everybody the same way. I'm a missionary. I go over into the land where the people there don't even know which is right and left hand. And they stand there. You know? What they do when they receive the Holy Ghost, same thing you do, same thing. Oh, what is it? It's for you and for your children and to them that's far off, even as many as Lord our God shall call. This same prescription works the same thing. And the church will do the same thing 
it did at the beginning exactly right. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And by being inoculated by that life that was in the vine, the church that went out inoculated, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. Now we got some substitute, we got some graft grafted fruits. It leaves off of the life of the tree, but it won't bear the fruits. That's right. I was standing with a friend of mine, John Sherritt, over in Phoenix not long ago. He had a tree there, an orange tree, that had about five or six different kinds of fruit on it. I said, I've never seen such a thing as that. He said, they were grafted. I said, what kind of a tree? He said, orange. I said, well, there is a lemon, there is a lime, there is tangerines and tangelos and grapefruit, many different kinds. I said, all, and all of them is raised off of that same tree. He said, yeah, it's all citrus fruit. I said, well, now, that's a strange thing. I said, now, in this year, after all that fruit goes off next year, will it bring forth an orange? He said, oh, no. Uh-huh. No, said it will bring forth the same, the kind that is the limb is. And I said, then, that tree turned from, you mean, from the orange tree to what? He said, no, no, no. If it ever puts forth another limb, it brings forth an orange. I said, I see, amen, brother. We've got such things as such dominations injected into this and living off of it, calling themselves Christians. But if the real life of that tree ever puts forth another branch of its own, it will be another book of Acts behind it. For he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What the world and the treasures, and they don't know nothing about. The people reading this Bible, if you read it from the denominational standpoint, you will not get much from it. But if you just look to what it says, then obey what the prescription says, read it, obey it, it will make a different person. I just come home from India. Here not long ago, I heard of a woman over there, she was poverty stricken, her son was, had went to India to be a doctor. And he got over there and he got away from his medical practice and got into another, I believe he was an electrical engineer or something. And this woman got poverty stricken. She just didn't have nothing and so Charity was trying to come and to uh, take care of her. And so they invested the case and when they investigated, they found out that the woman had one support and that was a son that was a very wealthy man in India and said, well, why don't your son support you? I said, oh, I just couldn't ask him, said, I'm his mother, I said, I just rather take Charity than to ask my son, I said, don't you never hear from him? Said, oh, I hear from him at least once or twice a month. Said, he writes me on uh, some of the most sweetest letters that you ever read. Said, well, look like if he loved you, his mother enough, and he had plenty of money, he would be trying to take care of her instead of her having to go to charity. Said, well, perhaps if he knew I was this away, he said, he would, he would take care of me. But said, you know, he doesn't know, and I just feel embarrassed to tell my son like that and said and he still writes these sweet letters said oh some of the sweetest letters and said he sends me the prettiest pictures you ever seen said the prettiest pictures so let's see some of them she went through her bible and she pulled them out you know what they was bank drafts india puts pictures on their bank drafts you see pretty pictures she had thousands of dollars converted from the indian money into american money what was it? In the ledger of her, her Bible, she had treasures that she thought was just pictures, but come to find out it was real value to her. And brother, when you try to read of our painted fire Pentecost, and somebody tries to tell you that the Holy Spirit isn't the same today as it was then, somebody tries to tell you that the miracles is past, that Jesus Christ isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever, that uh, they try to tell you, don't believe it. And them is not pictures. God Almighty sent that message to you. That's right. It's for you and your children to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord of God shall call. God is still God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is right here tonight to save the lost, to heal the sick, to fill with the Holy Spirit for those who desire to be filled. You believe that, don't you? Yes, sir. If you believe it, then you see that's God's promises in this word here. 
you can get right in there and find every promise. The promise is unto you. Peter said, the promise is unto you and your children and to them that's far off. Don't be afraid to cash that. That's a bankrupt of heaven. That's right. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What if he stood here tonight and seen that woman laying there sick? She looks like she's very sick, crippled, probably paralytic or something. Two women, a woman and a colored man and a colored woman trying to work with a little baby. What do you think he would do if he stood there and then two patients there as a healer? Do you think he can heal them? He has already done it, you see. When he died at Calvary, he done it. Do you believe that? Patients, do you believe? That's right. You there, the little colored lady there with the baby, do you believe Jesus Christ? When he died at Calvary, he purchased the healing of your child. You on the court there, if you are, you look very sick, you're paralyzed. Whatever it is, do you believe in Jesus Christ died at Calvary to save you from your sickness? Do you believe that? Do you believe that what I've said tonight, that is true? Do you believe that prescription is true? You do? If he stood here tonight and you asked him, will you heal my child? You know what he'd say. I've already done that, see? You just believe it, see? If you would say, sir, I'm crippled, can't walk, or whatever it is, I can't walk, I'm dying or something, will you save me? He would say, I've already done it, see? Now, how would you know it was his voice? Because he would do something like he did then. He might be able to tell you something about yourself, tell you what you were or what was wrong with you or something like that, like he did in the Bible time, that would show he was the same. But for healing, you would have to accept it yourself. He was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we were healed. Do you believe that? Do you believe he could tell me tonight what's your trouble or something about you laying there? Would you accept it and believe me to be his prophet? You will. What about you, the lady there next to her with your hand on your baby? Do you believe that? How many will believe it? Now, Heavenly Father, this is your servant. I've just, I'm just responsible for preaching your word now. I know this is unusual, but I pray that you will grant it tonight that the people might know that, that this is truth. All right, look this away. Your baby has some kind of bone disease, that's right. It's got some big swelling in the leg, is that right? Keep your hand on it. Repeat and say, Lord Jesus, heal my baby. I'll serve you all my life. If you'll never took this inoculation, believe it with all your heart, and put a string around that baby's leg tonight and measure it, and then bring the string back tomorrow where you cut it off, how much of it shrunk between now and tomorrow night. Will you do that? You laying there next. Do you believe me to be a servant? I've never seen you in my life, but you're laying there shadow to death. There is a dark shadow over the woman. She is suffering, dying with cancer. That's exactly right. And you believe that God will make you well. Can you believe it? Then why do you lay there till you die? The doctor can't heal that. Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ and take up your bed and go home. Do you believe? All that wants to believe and accept your healing, stand up on your feet and thank God. Take up with the arm, my brother. Let's say praise the Lord, everybody. Do you believe him? Raise your hands now to God and praise him. Do you believe? Is there no bombing Gilead? The power of God can do that. Let's raise to our feet, everybody now with faith to believe it. Stand up to your feet, everybody, and accept deliverance in the name of the Lord. Amen.